Hi there, my name is Christopher Collison and today we're going to talk about kinetics. And kinetics is particularly important because we're dealing with time. We're thinking about how we might accelerate a particular reaction. And we're also thinking about how we might slow down a particular reaction. We all recognize that when we put vegetables in the fridge, we can slow down the rate at which they spoil. Um, we also might want to think about how we can biodegrade plastics more quickly um, when they get thrown into um, landfill uh, sites. So these are things that chemists think about regularly and we're going to talk about which of those uh, parameters in the world impact the rate of reaction the most. So let's take a look. As I mentioned, kinetics is about how long things take. Uh, rusting of iron, vegetable spoiling in the fridge, um, or not in the fridge, um, and as I mentioned, plastic uh, and, and its biodegradation. So how long would it take um, for a chemical reaction to take place? So we're going to start by thinking about what's going on in a chemical reaction. This is chemistry after all. Um, and so we, we're going to start by thinking about this in terms of chemistry. So we're thinking about the speed with which reactants disappear or the speed at which products form. And we're going to call this the rate of the reaction. And we're often interested in this in chemistry because um, we can determine from a study of the rate of reaction, we can determine what steps go into a particular reaction. And that list of steps the steps is called the reaction mechanism it's how the how the reaction takes place and um, this ends up being really important if we understand how a, a reaction takes place then we actually can speed up that reaction or we can perhaps improve its yield and this ends up being important um, in pharmaceutical chemistry for example let's look at a few diagrams in, in this particular case we've got a graph we have moles on the y-axis and we have time on the x-axis and in this particular case we're moving from the red material in here and this is um, what we would call a first order reaction so we've got each one of these um, molecules is turning into um, a blue molecule in one way or another um, and so we we move in this general direction as indeed the material A decreases in concentration then the concentration of material B increases um, so the steeper the this concentration so this would be in a particular volume this would be moles per liter for example but the steeper this concentration versus time curve is the faster the reaction rate and so we we talk about often the slope of this curve, certainly in the case of the blue curve, um, the rate of the reaction would be equal to the rate of change of concentration with respect to time. And that's a way of defining the rate of the reaction. So what does the rate depend on? So what do you think? Uh, jot down a few things as to what you think the rate of the reaction might depend on. We've talked about the idea of putting milk in the fridge. Why do we cook rice with boiling water, for example? Why don't we just put rice in cold water and let it and let the rice absorb the water? Um, if we use powdered drinks, right? Powdered milk, Kool-Aid. Why is this a powder? Why is, doesn't this come as a big lump? Uh, why does the body need enzymes? Okay, so all of these uh, particular um, examples illustrate a, a factor that helps increase the rate of a reaction. And it turns out there are five principal factors influencing uh, reaction rates. First of all, we're going to have the chemical nature of the reactant. So some um, materials are particularly fast reacting. Uh, we know that some materials are explosives, the explosive, TNT, for example. Also gasoline, of course, reacting with oxygen uh, in an internal combustion engine that we might expect to, to be uh, an explosive reaction. It's a very fast reaction once that reaction uh, is started. Um, we also have to think about the ability of reactants to contact each other. So reactants can only react when they touch each other. Okay. Um, third, 
we would talk about the, the concentration of the reactants. And by the way, too, this, this we might think about in terms of, you know, if we have a solid uh, and another solid uh, and we need to have a reaction between those two solids, we might expect that their ability to contact is quite low. So we'll talk about that in a second. The fourth one, very important, temperature is important. By the way, in this particular lab, we're going to talk about in particular three and four. Um, and number five here, the availability of, of catalysts. And so enzymes are catalysts in our body, uh, biological catalysts. Um, so these accelerate the rates of reaction. So we're going to discuss each one very briefly. So we know that um, in chemistry, bonds break and form during reactions. Um, the, the most fundamental difference in the reaction rates lie in the reactants themselves. Um, some are fast by nature, others slow. We're going to say less about this particular um, example for this course, for this um, chemistry lab. But bottom line is we all know that certain things react more quickly than others. We might, for example, consider potassium and water being a fairly fast reaction, um, whereas something like lead and water is a very slow reaction uh, and, and we can think about that in terms of the activity series of metals but the bottom line here is that the chemical nature of the reactants influences the rate. We also must consider the ability of the reactants to meet. So most reactions that we'll come across in chemistry require that particles, so atoms, molecules, ions, they collide before the reaction can occur. Of course, we have exceptions. Um, we're familiar with radioactivity, um, so that's a, a, a nuclear process. Um, but it doesn't require that two atoms come into contact with each other. We might also come across things like fluorescence in, in chemistry. So that's an excited state state of a molecule and we don't need for that molecule to hit another molecule in order for that excited state to drop back down to its ground state. So these are specific exceptions that I won't go into today. Um, but if we're thinking really about this particular idea, the ability of reactants to meet, it depends on the phase of the reactant. So the question I put earlier to you was, can two solids react as quickly as two liquids? Um, probably not. Um, uh, what about a liquid and a gas? Um, so when reactants are in the gas phase, we can expect all those molecules to intermingle and react very effectively. When molecules and ions and, and atoms are in the solution phase, don't, then those um, atoms, those particles have a mechanism by which they can interact with each other as they move through the solvent medium. Um, so we often, when we're thinking about kinetics, we think about whether a reaction is homogeneous. You know, are the reactants in the same phase? If they're both in solution, then we're in great shape. If they're both in the gas phase, then we're in good shape. They're going to react quickly. Um, if they're in different phases, we talk about this as a heterogeneous reaction. Um, and in heterogeneous reactions, uh, those reactants meet only at the interface between those phases. So we have to think about the interfacial surface area. So earlier I mentioned Kool-Aid and I said why does why does Kool-Aid come in a powder form? Let's explore that fairly quickly. This is the same mass of material on the left hand side here. We can consider this mass in two forms. We could consider one big block of that mass and that material let's let's say it's one centimeter it's a cube with one centimeter um, sides. So of course there are six faces and each face here is one centimeter by one centimeter. So six faces each of one centimeter squared we end up with a total surface area of six centimeters squared. If we chop this um, larger particle up into smaller cubes each with 0 0.01 centimeters as, as an edge we now have one million of these tiny little cubes. And so if we look at the total surface area, so again what we're doing here, instead of 0 0.01 centimeters, we're going to have 0 0.06 centimeters squared. So 0 0.06 centimeters squared multiplied by a million gives us a total surface area of 600 centimeters squared. So this is a hundred times larger uh, surface area when we divide that cube um, into a hundred times smaller particles.
So the point here is when we greatly increase the surface area for a heterogeneous reaction, the rate of that reaction will increase greatly. So now we're going to talk about uh, two factors that are going to play a particularly important role in this experiment. So number three here is the concentration of the reactants. Um, and the homogeneous and heterogeneous reaction rates are affected by reactant concentration. And we're also going to talk about the temperature of the system. So when we think about the concentration of the reactants, so effectively that's the number of molecules or particles within a certain volume. So the greater the number of these particles, then the greater the opportunity that two of them will interact favorably and will form um, a product. So that should be somewhat intuitive to think about that. Um, next on this slide, we have the temperature um, of the system. So when we think about reactions taking place and the probability that two reactants, two molecules will interact with each other, well, if these molecules are moving more quickly, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail uh, shortly, but if the uh, kinetic energy, if, if the molecules are moving more quickly, not only are we going to get more collisions, but also the collisions that take place are going to happen with more uh, energy, with more force. Um, and so we're going to generally find that for all chemical reactions, these rates increase as the temperature is increased. Uh, and that's really the, the main point here is this is why we put things in the fridge. So we're going to explore these things in our lab. I also want to just bring up the importance of a catalyst. Um, so this is particularly important industrially and also in our in 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 with regard to life and uh, enzymes. So enzymes, of course, are biological catalysts um, that direct our body chemistry. But let's also make sure we just define a catalyst here. So a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without being consumed itself. It's not truly a reactant in that reaction. It just facilitates and reduces something called the activation energy, which will also be important for this particular lab. So how do we measure rates of reaction? As I mentioned earlier, rates are always going to be a change in concentration divided by a change in time. Um, so time is always in the denominator. Um, and what we do is we, we find one component in a particular reaction and we describe the change in concentration per unit time for that component. Now, of course, if we have A plus B uh, going to C, then we can also recognize that the rate, um, rate, by the way, is always a positive number. So because rate is always a positive number, we can describe the rate of progress of this reaction as a minus. Um, remember, the concentration here is going to decrease over time. So because dA in here is going to be a negative number, uh, in order for rate to be a positive number, we need a minus sign that gets placed conventionally in front of this expression. Um, and that rate is also going to be equal to the rate of increase of component C. So that's our rate. That's how we define our rate for this particular reaction. Um, this is shown perhaps using um, calculus type terms. Um, another way of writing this is if we think about the concentration of X of a component X in a reaction, whereas A, B or C at time T2, we subtract the concentration of X at an earlier time, T1, uh, and then we divide that by the denominator, which is the difference in time for those two components. So we end up having delta X divided by delta T. And of course, when we get to infinitesimally small um, changes, that's what brings in calculus, which is where our expression comes from in the top right here. The units, Okay, so units we're usually going to be thinking about for rate um, uh, m um, units of molarity per second. Um, so that's typically moles per liter per second, uh, as described in the green panel. So 
Let's ask ourselves some other questions that are going to be particularly important for this lab. And the key question I put to you right now is, is a rate usually constant throughout a reaction? Well, the answer is typically no, because the concentration often changes. So usually a reaction rate is generally not constant during a reaction. Um, why? The concentration of reactants tends to change, right? If we go forward in a reaction, we're reducing the amount of concentration. And if rate is typically proportional to the concentration, uh, then we're going to expect these rates to change as the reactants are used up. So the rate at any particular moment, we're going to call the instantaneous rate. And by the way, again, we can use our calculus in here and we can refer to some component x. So it's the rate of change of concentration with respect to time, and that's going to be the slope of the curve that we plot when we plot concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So this is a concentration versus time plot. So let's have a look at that visually. So here's an example. Here's a reaction um, where hydrogen iodide as a gas uh, breaks down to form hydrogen gas and iodine gas. Um, so what we see here is the reduction. So we're going to see a, a drop in concentration of, of hydrogen iodide. Okay, so moles per liter. It's a, it's a gas, but we can also, if we have that gas in a fixed volume, we can have a concentration, number of moles per liter, and that drops over a period of time as the reaction moves uh, forward. Um, and as that reaction moves forward and as the concentration decreases, the slope of this curve, right, that we see in here, the slope of this curve is changing. So that the, the steepest slope happens when we have the highest concentration, but we can always measure an instantaneous rate. Okay, and that ends up being the slope of this curve. Um, and it's explained using this panel. I won't go into that. Again, because this is a negative slope, right, because we're measuring the disappearance of this hydrogen iodide gas, so it's going to be a negative number, but we remind ourselves again that by convention rates are positive numbers, and so we end up writing this as a, a positive um, value. So the rate in this case would be equal to minus dHi by dt. But the main thing here is the rate changes from the steeper slope at the top here uh, to the, the, the lower slope as the time progresses in the reaction. So there's a couple of things that we can do as we want to get to a quantitative understanding of reaction rates. And again, this leads us to some of the key ideas for this particular experiment. Once we understand these ideas, the experiment itself is going to be easy and the data analysis is going to be much easier. So we will say, and I will tell you that the rate of a homogeneous reaction at any instant is proportional to the product of the molar concentrations of the reactants raised to a power determined from experiment. So if we look again at this general reaction, A plus B goes to products, right? What am I saying? I'm saying that that rate is proportional to the concentration of each of these components. So we have square brackets A, the concentration of A, square brackets B, the concentration of B, the rate is proportional to these concentrations raised to certain powers, and those powers M and N in here are called the orders of reaction. They are uh, determined from experiment. They cannot be predicted. They are measured from experiment. This is what you're going to be doing in this particular experiment that you're going to run. By the way, these numbers can be integers or fractions. And they can also be negative. So that's m and n can be integers or fractions, and they can be negative. Okay, so the rate is proportional to the concentrations of a and b raised to these exponents. The exponents are called orders. The proportionality means that we need a proportionality constant, and we're going to call this the rate constant.
for the reaction. Again, what's most important here is we cannot predict this rate equation. It is determined from experiment. And this is what you're going to be doing in this lab. Here's an example. So this is a redox reaction. Uh, we have iodide ions in here. Some of these iodide ions uh, get reduced to uh, I0 or I0. So we've got an, uh, an I3- ion here. So at the same time that those are oxidized, the selenium in here ends up reduced. So it's reduced to the elemental form of selenium. Uh, the key, though, is that we can't predict what the rate law is just by looking at the equation. So this is actually determined from experiment, and it turns out that the rate law for this reaction is as described, and we find that the orders of the reaction are 1, uh, 3, and 2, respectively for the um, selenous acid, uh, the iodide ions and the the protons okay and so we can put some numbers in here and it turns out that the rate constant um, actually has some quite crazy units um, 5.0 times 10 to the 5 and that's liters to the fifth um, per uh, moles to the fifth per second um, and that's the rate constant these units start to get a bit crazy because the rate itself must have units of uh, moles per liter per second. We've got some more numbers in here, so we actually put some uh, values in here. If we have one mole of each of these starting reactants, so we can actually calculate the rate at which the selenium concentration increases, and that's at a rate of 5 times 10 to the 5 moles per liter per second. Okay, so what do these exponents mean? So there's a lots more um, sort of numbers on this page where you can have a have a look at. You know, if we double the number of moles of iodide, the iodide concentration is raised to the power of three. In here, what we find is that when we double the the concentration of the iodide, actually the rate goes up by a factor of eight, and that ends up being two to the three. So these um, orders uh, tell us how much the rate uh, increases when we increase the concentration of a particular component. So most important here is that these exponents are, are unrelated typically to the chemical equations coefficients. So they have nothing to do with the chemical equation itself, so never assume that those exponents and the coefficients are the same. These exponents must be determined by uh, experiment. And again, this is called, these exponents are called the orders of reaction with respect to the corresponding reactant. And so this will help you in your experiment that you'll do in this class. We can also say that the reaction is first order with respect to the selenous acid. Uh, it's third order with respect to the iodide and second order with respect to protons. Overall, we add up these numbers. Okay, so 1 plus 3 plus 2, and that gives us the overall order of the reaction, which is 6. So this is a sixth order reaction overall. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, these exponents can be fractional, negative, uh, and even 0. So the exper exponents are experimentally determined. Uh, how might we do that? So one way you can do this as you're working through your experiment is you can look for patterns in experimental data. Um, earlier I showed you that when we increased the rate by a factor of 8, when we doubled um, the concentration of the iodide, um, this kind of informs us actually that the order of the reaction there is uh, 3 with respect to the iodide. Um, the easiest way to reveal these patterns in the data, therefore, is to change the concentration in a fixed way. Um, so we use these different sets of conditions. So usually we might double the, the concentration of a particular component. Let's have a look at an example. So again, we'll come back to our A plus B goes to products idea here. And we've got our rate law um, that's written at the bottom of the page. And what we're going to do is imagine um, some initial concentrations in this reaction. And if you look at these um, different experiments, we have five experiments here, and if you look at the first three experiments, we're actually increasing the concentration of A from 0.1 to 0.2 uh, 
to 0.3. And then the next, next set of experiments, we're actually maintaining uh, the 0.3 concentration for A, and now we're changing the concentration of B from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3. And what we can do is if we can measure the initial rate, remember we, we follow one particular concentration, and that concentration, um, that rate is going to change that initial rate in here is the slope of the curve at time is equal to zero if we can measure that initial rate and that's somewhat what we're going to be trying to do in this particular experiment so if we can measure that initial rate if we notice that the rate um, scales it has a linear relationship with the concentration of a so we're going to expect that this is simply just a proportionality right it's just got an order of one in this case though as we increase the concentration from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.3 well the reaction rate goes it scales uh, as a factor of four here so from 0.6 to to 2.4 that's a factor of four as we've gone through a factor of two with the concentration of b okay and we've also if we look at this here if we go from from experiment three to experiment five, okay, and we've tripled in this case, we, we've tripled as we go from point 0.1 to point 0.3, so we've got a factor of times three in here. Well, in this case, point 0.6 times nine actually will get us to 5.4, so there's a nine times increase in here. So it looks like the rate uh, increases at the square of the concentration change for B. So think about that for a little bit. But in other words, what we can do is therefore predict, um, and this should not be an, a, an M in here, that should be a B in here. So we would predict that the orders are one and two respectively. And that's how we can use an experimental approach to determine the rates of a reaction. They're described more in this second slide. Okay, and so the idea here is that we can take the rate in experiment two and divide it by the initial rate of experiment one. And um, what this means, actually, by the way, is that we've because we were keeping the concentration of B the same in both both cases. Okay, what we've effectively done is we've cancelled those. Okay, so we, we plug these rates on top of each other. Uh, that's written in your handout. Uh, but we can cancel these because they're effectively constant, and that leaves us with an assessment of how the rate changes uh, only as a function of the, the concentrations of, of A in here. So we plug these numbers in, and we determine that this value ends up being 2. And, and you can see almost by pattern, so think about this a little bit, but the order of that reaction is one, and that's how I tried to describe it on the previous slide. Um, experiments three, four, and five. Again, A is held constant, so we can take rate four divided by rate three, okay? And it's equal to K A raised to the M. Um, and this time, the B is varied, so we can have um, experiment three in here and this be experiment four in here but these two end up being the same they're constant so they get cancelled out and so this brings us to the expression that we have on the left hand side think through this write this down yourselves if you're not following okay and we recognize that the increase in rate is a factor of four and that increase of rate is also equal to the difference in concentrations of B inside these parentheses raised to the factor of N. So basically, 2 to the N is equal to 4, and that tells us that N must be equal to 2. So this is just an illustration and an example of how we might um, determine the orders of a reaction by looking at the patterns of a series of experiments where we vary the concentrations of the reactants. So our final um, rate equation here would be uh, rate is equal to K times the concentration of A raised to 1 times the concentration of B raised to the second order B. And then the last thing we need to do if we've measured the rate um, and, and if we 
Um, so if we measure the rate at any one particular place, and if we know the concentrations that we started with for A and B, so we just plug these numbers in, and that's going to allow us very quickly algebraically to determine what the rate constant is. So again, you're going to be doing something very similar to this in your experiment. As I mentioned before, rate constant also depends on temperature, and, and how and why does it depend on temperature? Um, well, there's something called an activation energy barrier. So basically, if we have two particles that are colliding, and most reactions involve a collision of two particles, so they must have a certain kinetic energy, minimum kinetic energy, to overcome the, the uh, repulsive forces within those molecules. You know, we have electrons around the outside, and as two molecules are whizzing close to each other, they're going to feel some repulsion. So they have to have enough speed to overcome that repulsion, uh, and that kinetic energy that is associated with their speed uh, is called the activation energy and we're going to calculate that in this particular experiment so it turns out that only a small fraction of the well-oriented colliding molecules um, have um, enough energy to start a reaction um, when that activation energy is large we'll look at some figures in a second um, temperature of course increases so temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the reacting particles, that's the Boltzmann distribution, in case you're interested. And this Boltzmann distribution idea um, shows us that here are the fraction of collisions that have a certain kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is on the x-axis in here. And so kinetic energy increases over here, and it turns out that we are drawing somewhat arbitrarily. Uh, we have a kinetic, uh, uh, an activation energy that's here on this graph. So it turns out that anything to the right of this line will react. So what happens as we increase the temperature, so temperature T2 is greater than T1 in this particular example, what happens is this distribution um, uh, uh, of kinetic energies as we increase the temperature, there are more particles that have a higher kinetic energy. So we've seen a move in the, the the peak of this curve and that also means by the way that the area shaded under this curve is increased so at higher temperatures it turns out that more particles have a kinetic energy that's higher than that uh, activation energy barrier for the reaction we care about so again how might we look at this activation energy barrier so in an exothermic reaction, we've talked about exothermic reactions for thermochemistry. So here's the, the heat of a particular reaction, but many reactions require us to, to go uphill um, in order to overcome perhaps repulsions between particular molecules. So we have to go up uphill and overcome this activation energy barrier in order to actually um, yield energy from the um, from the reaction so this is an exothermic reaction heat would be given off in the end but we still need heat in the first place we still need a higher temperature for these reactants to be able to overcome that activation energy barrier here's what we're going to do in this particular experiment um, there is an equation called the Arrhenius equation. This Arrhenius equation is very useful in industry for accelerating li accelerated lifetime tests. If you want to uh, sell a television that you claim will have 20 years of life, um, you don't want to be measuring uh, in a lab for 20 years whether or not that TV will actually last in somebody's home. Uh, so we use something called accelerated testing. We effectively increase the temperature, which increases the rate constant, and that allows us to do accelerated testing in industrial labs to prove, for example, that televisions uh, will last uh, for 20 years, even though the experiment in the manufacturer's lab may only take two months, for example. So in this particular Arrhenius, equation we've got the rate constant in here the rate constant varies with temperature so t is temperature um, r is the ideal gas constant 8.314 joules per mole per kelvin uh, the activation energy is given here and that's in units of joules 
um, E is the base of the natural logarithm, and A is also called the, the pre-exponential factor. Okay, so the frequency factor or the pre-exponential factor. The temperature must be in Kelvin, must be in Kelvin. If we have information on the rate, so supposing um, we have uh, measurements of rate and we know the rate law, well, we can determine what the rate constant is and we can, of course, vary the temperature. How might we plot that graphically in order to calculate the activation energy? Well, what we do is we take natural logs of our expression. So, take natural logs of our equation, and this gives us ln k equals ln a minus, well, this was an exponent, so this becomes now minus the activation energy divided by rt. And we can think about this now as a straight line plot. So, the ln k, if we plot the natural log of k, that's our y-axis. Okay, so this is our measured value. We can vary the temperature of, of the experiment. So 1 over the temperature becomes our x-axis. And then, of course, now we have a slope, and the slope becomes minus E A over R. That's the slope. So we've got this minus sign in here. So we expect this to be a negative slope. We actually expect it to be like this. Here's 1 over t on the x-axis, and this is the natural log of k on the y-axis, and the slope ends up being a, a positive activation energy with a minus sign in front of it divided by the ideal gas constant. Here's another way of writing that expression. Okay, so actually you can calculate the activation energy even if you're working at two temperatures. Of course, we've seen how using a linear regression and using multiple measurements helps us identify um, the errors in our measurement, especially when we're trying to determine the slope and therefore the activation energy for our particular experiment. So a lot of you are thinking, wow, that was a lot of background information in order to understand what we're doing in this experiment. And none of the examples I gave were associated with the specific reaction that's taking place in your lab. However, if we understand the principles of kinetics, we're going to find that all the calculations we do in this particular experiment are going to be a lot easier. Okay, When we understand what's happening in chemistry, we can more easily uh, apply that understanding and it becomes a lot more powerful. And that's the key here. So a long video. Um, thank you very much for listening. It's going to help you to explore some of these ideas and um, good luck with your lab. You'll see a couple more videos where I talk about very specifically what to do during the lab and how we're going to run this experiment and some of the calculations that you're going to do. That will follow, um, but I hope you've enjoyed the background and I hope that you find that powerful as you move forward in your careers. Thanks for listening.